And we're back, folks, right here in WrestleRant. I'm Graham G.S. and Matthews, and on WrestleRant, I break down every single pay-per-view that I watch on the WWE Network. Today, we were talking 2015 TLC pay-per-view, and the best part about this show was that I was there in attendance, that I get to talk about the show from a different perspective, my, you know, on-site report, which we talked about at that time a year ago on WrestleRant Radio and so on and so forth, but watching it back... You know, fun fact for you, I have yet or had yet to watch this show back until I had watched the back for this show. Um, I had seen the ladder match. I think I rewatched that shortly after the show, you know, right before Christmas or something last year. Other than that, I had not seen any other part of the show on the WWE Network, believe it or not. So this is my first time watching it back, and I'll talk about it play by play, match by match for you guys right here on WrestleRant. So also stay tuned until the end. This will be the final WrestleRant edition of 2016. So I'll talk about more why that is at the end of the video. So be sure to stay tuned until the end for more information on that. So anyway, TLC 2015 kicking off with. A lot like 2014, the match of the night in a ladder match at that, a triple threat tag team title match. The WWE Tag Team Championships being defended in this contest. The New Day defending against the Usos and the Lucha Dragons. And I was so excited when this was announced, like a couple weeks before the show, um, because I knew I was going to be there. And because I had been asking, I had been begging for a match like this for so many years. I could not tell you the last tag team ladder match that we had prior to this point, probably in the early 2000s. Um, I know the Hardys and Eminem. No, sorry, that's a lie. Yeah, so Hardys and the Eminem, the, the Hardys and Eminem, not the Eminem, sorry. Eminem, the Hardys, London and Kendrick, and Regal and Dave Taylor, I think was the last tag team ladder match we ever had. And coincidentally enough, that was almost exactly 10 years to the day from Armageddon, or no, not 10 years, sorry, nine years from Armageddon 2006, I think it was, which I talked about here in the show a couple weeks ago. Um, but wow, to think that it had been that, and I might be mistaken, there might have been a tag team ladder match after that, but I'm pretty sure that was the last one. So that being said, I was really hoping for a match like this, you know, at the 2012 installment with like the fucking primetime players and I think Team Hell No and maybe another uh, another team from that time period, I forgot who it was. Uh, what other teams were hot at that time, I can't recall. But anyway, uh, I had been waiting such a long time for this match, and it surely not only met my expectations, but exceeded my expectations. This was a fucking phenomenal match. Every single person in this match, all six and all seven superstars, if you want to include Xavier Woods. Okay, we'll say eight superstars, including Francesca as well. Uh, really delivered here. Everyone played the role well. It was... Again, a lot like the TLC, or not the TLC, but rather the latter match from the TLC show the year prior between Dolph Ziggler and Luke Harper. A lot less bloody, but still equally brutal. Taking, you know, spot after spot, bump after bump through these ladders, and it was fucking insane. And reckless at times, I will say that. I, said that, I know I said that about Harper and Ziggler, and I will not make an exception for this match. There were a lot of reckless bumps that probably should not have been taken, but for my own personal enjoyment, my own... Uh, Perverse enjoyment. I love the hell out of this match. All three teams were great here. A number of awesome spots of the ladders. I cannot even begin to recall, you know, uh, go down, list, rank down, every single one that happened. But it was pretty amazing, to say the least. Um, obviously, the spot, not only of the match, but of the night, was when Kalisto, I think, I don't know whether it was to Jimmy Uso or Jey Uso, not like it matters anyway, when he did the Salida del Sol off the top of the ladder, and to Jay and through another ladder that was in in between that ladder and the ropes. You gotta see it in order to believe it. I'm sure you have seen it before if you've been watching for the past year. What an amazing spot. The crowd came unglued. I lost, I think, my voice right then and there when that happened. It was just an amazing spot. Uh, just crazy stuff. And really the breakout moment for Kalisto. Because, you know, up to that point, the Lucha Dragons... For as entertaining as they were in NXT and on the main roster, Creative never really had anything for them. You know, they had a multi-stint, a multi-month stint as NXT Tag Team Champions, obviously in NXT, but on the main roster, they never really found their groove. They never really went for the tag team titles more often than not. They contended for the gold once at SummerSlam, and that was it. Um, this was their shot. I thought they were winning here. You know, New Day went on to hold the championships throughout the you know majority of 2016. So, that obviously did not happen. But the match itself was amazing. Kalisto, after that amazing spot, was about to win the win the tag team titles for his team, for him and Sin Cara, before Xavier Woods gets off of commentary. And the commentary during this match was abysmal. Michael Cole, and maybe even JBL, I think it was mostly Cole, though, was just calling Sin Cara, Kalisto, and vice versa. Multiple times. Not once, not twice, but multiple fucking times. And it was like, how, how could you possibly get the people's names wrong 
that many times in one match. It was ridiculous. And it's not like, I know they're wearing like the same color attire and shit, but Kalisto's got the top of the thing, that, that thing on the top of his mask, and he's smaller too. It's pretty obvious. I could see them mixing up the Usos, which I think they probably did do on a few occasions in this match. Sin Cara and Kalisto, or you, you can't mistake them. That was just embarrassing. So anyway, Xavier Woods gets off of commentary, throws Francesca on the back of Kalisto, who just gets thrown off the ladder by Big E. And then Big E capitalizes, or I think it might have been Kofi, I forgot. I'm pretty sure it was Kofi. Uh, they reclaim the titles and are still the WWE Tag Team Champions. And to me, I, I really do think, and I know, you know what? I was thinking about this too, and maybe someone can enlighten me here. Obviously, the tag team wrestling was was hot. It was memorable during the time that the Hardy Boys, Edge and Christian, you know, fucking the Dudley Boys were on top in 2000, 2001. But really, really for a second, let's be let's be real for a second. Beyond those three teams, what did that division consist of? I remember, I still do read reviews of those pay-per-views from those time periods. And I still see, like, especially in 2001, people were saying, like, oh, man, we've seen every combination of the Hardys and Dudleys. Why are we still getting these matches? Obviously, they always worked well together. But those were really the only three teams that fucking mattered. And nowadays, people shit on tag team wrestling. Is it amazing? No. But the division is infinitely, on both brands, infinitely better than it has been in many, many fucking years. And I'm talking about 2010, when we only had like the Hart Dynasty as champions for like five months, and literally no one had challenged them other than the Usos. I can't even tell you how many times I saw that match on Raw, pay-per-view, fucking superstars. It got so bad they had to put Cody Rhodes and Drew McIntyre together as a makeshift tag team just to add spice, kind of spice up the tag team division. So I don't want to go on a huge rant about tag team wrestling, but it's like, people, appreciate what we have. It is infinitely better than anything we have gotten in the past fucking 10 years. And I'm talking about even during the first brand split, when we had, you know, London and Kendrick weren't champions for a year for nothing. It's because they had hardly any fucking challengers. Well, they had Aaron Stevens, Damian Sand, Idol Stevens, sorry, and fucking Casey James. That's it. Deuce and Domino, who they feuded with multiple times before they finally dropped the belts to him in 2007. So you know what? People, please, enjoy it for what it is. This match was incredible. And I hate to go on off a huge rant about tag team wrestling and a TLC 2015 review, but it's like easily the best tag team match I've seen in almost a long... Other than the Shield versus uh, fucking... The Shield versus the Rhodes Brothers from Battleground 2013. This, from an in-ring standpoint, was just spectacular. And one of the best tag team matches I've seen in years. So two thumbs up. Uh, just amazing work to everyone involved in this contest. After that, to, for a match, you know, we go from that to a match that was not so good uh, between Rusev and Ryback. I can't believe they devoted a whole video package to this match. It was really a forgettable feud. They had already feuded back in early 2015, and they finally culminated it all these months later. Rusev was not nearly as hot as he once before as he was once before. And Ryback, same thing, was not nearly as over as he was even at the onset of 2015. I'm not even talking about 2012, 2013 here. I'm talking first few months of 2015 when he came back as a babyface and people really wanted to see him take the fight to Rusev. And they dropped the ball on it. They went with Rusev and Cena instead, which we got a couple good matches out of and, of course, the U.S. Open, but it did no favors for Ryback whatsoever. So this match was pretty throwaway. Rusev won. And the stupidest part about it was that Ryback fell for Lana's same shit again. Because the story coming into this was that I think on not only one, but two occasions on Raw leading up to this pay-per-view, they had matches, and Rusev was worried that he hit Lana twice. Like, he accidentally ran into her, or he injured her, whatever. And it sounded, it looked like he ran into her again in the show, and he spent too much time debating whether it's like, whether she's faking or she's not... And obviously, if it happened already twice before in the weeks preceding this, why the hell would he believe her again? And even if she was legitimately injured, why the hell would he care? That's such a dumb baby face move. It obviously cost him the victory, but that was just a stupid finish. So we go from that to a cheers match for the United States Championship. A match, honestly, that was not as bad as I thought it was going to be. Um, not that I really cared about the feud between Alberto Del Rio and Jack Swagger, the challenger. Could not really have cared less you know, about the feud being reignited in, uh, in 2015, two and a half years after the WrestleMania match, which still blows my mind as a world championship match at WrestleMania 29. One of the worst WrestleManias in years, needless to say. Uh, this match really was not that bad. Again, their matches were not terrible. Uh, Del Rio is not completely dead yet as a character at this point in his second stint with WWE. 
And Jack Swagger, just no one gave a fuck. So everyone knew that he was not winning. But the match itself was a treat. Uh, I liked the ankle lock through the chair. I liked the uh, the stomp. The, Del- the stomp was always kind of a dumb finisher for Del Rio. But he did the stomp on top of a, a stack of chairs. That was pretty cool. So it wasn't as bad. Probably the best chairs match I've ever seen, to be honest with you. Um, if you go back to Ryback and Kane, sucked from 2014. 2013, we didn't have a chairs match, thank God. Uh, 2012, what was it? 2012, we had Big Show and Sheamus, abysmal. 2011, Big Show and Mark Henry, abysmal. 2010, we had Undertake, no, we had, no, I think they scrapped the chairs match. Did they do a chairs match in 2010? I don't think they did. I think they were going to do Del Rio and Rey Mysterio in a chairs match, but... They didn't do it. I don't know. They didn't. I, I don't remember. But I know we had one in 09 between uh, fucking, who was it? Uh, Undertaker and Batista, which also sucked. So again, probably the best chairs match I've ever seen. Not saying much, but it exceeded my expectations is the best thing I could say about this match. After that, an eight-man elimination tag team tables match between the Wyatt family and the ECW originals, Bubba Ray Dudley, Devon Dudley, Tommy Dreamer, and Rhino. Um, I since read, I read this like a month or so ago, Rob Van Dam was supposed to be in that eight-man tag team match on this show. And a lot of people were hoping it would be him. I know in the month or in the days leading up to the ultimate reveal of Rhino, which was cool considering Rhino was on NXT. Um, at that time, anyway, he had just been finished. He had just finished up his NXT run. So he was still technically a part of the company. So it kind of made sense to incorporate him in this angle as well. And he was still a very good worker. People still, he was still over. People still liked him and cared about him. So it was fine. But I remember it was either Rhino or Rob Van Dam. I had my money on coming back. Obviously, it was Rhino. But Rob Van Dam, they did reach out to him to uh, come in for this match. And I think, I don't know if it was supposed to be Dudley's and RVD or just it was supposed to be Dreamer, RVD. And the I don't really remember if it was supposed to be six-man, eight-man or whatever. That was the plan the entire time. I'm not sure. But obviously, RVD turned him down because he doesn't want to come back for a one-off. He wants to come back for a full you know, a full-fledged program. This was not. It lasted all of a few weeks. Um, still of a fine match. I enjoyed it. Eric Rowan was the only member of the Eric uh, of, the, of the Eric family, of the Wyatt family that was eliminated from that tandem. Otherwise, it was a complete sweep. Eric Rowan was the first one gone of the 3D through the table. Then it was Rhino, then Devon, then Dreamer, then Bubba. And I remember at the time, RJ also thought it was supposed to, it was a botch that Bubba was supposed to light the table and then, Tr- and then Strowman was going to put him through. I don't think so. Um, looking, wa- you know, watching it back, they never really, there was never really a sense of awkwardness. I don't really know exactly for a fact, but it would seem like the table was never really intended to be on fire, just to tease the crowd before they didn't deliver. So I never really thought that was a, supposed to be a botch, but whatever. The match was all right. The Wyatt family won. Obviously did them no favors. I was glad they won. But what do they go on to do? Job the fucking Brock Lesnar? Not compete at WrestleMania? Not like it really mattered. So anyway, the match was all right. Uh, Bray Wyatt goes over, and then afterwards, they continue the feud. They had in the next match on the next night's Raw, and I think that wasn't a tables match, but an Extreme Rules match. That was actually a lot better than this match. Still good for what it was. Wyatt Family went 2-0 against ECW Originals. Intercontinental Championship, Dean Ambrose versus Kevin Owens. Again, a really good match. I think they're only second or third encounter ever on the main roster. Dean Ambrose surprisingly going over. I was super psyched to see that just because no one thought that was going to happen. Uh, I think a lot of people were banking on a KO victory here and a successful title defense. Obviously, it did not happen. The crowd popped huge. Probably one of the biggest pops tonight next to Kalisto, uh, the Salida Del Sol off the top of the ladder. But a really good match, a surprise ending. They would continue their feud through the Royal Rumble in a great last man standing match. The right outcome and probably one of the better matches of the night. Charlotte and Paige did not have a good match. I thought their Survivor Series match was better. It's just because if you watch the video package, for one, no one gave a shit about the women at this point. A lot less than they do now. And two, you couldn't really tell who was supposed to be the babyface and the heel. Because when we were there at the show... Paige got cheered over Charlotte, and Charlotte was supposed to be the babyface. I mean, she would go officially heel like a couple weeks later, but the psychology here sucks. Charlotte retained after cheating, after help from Ric Flair, so just the, the whole confusion surrounding this match really ruined it for a lot of people. And then they made the TLC match between Sheamus and Roman Reigns to the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. I just could not, I don't think anyone could really get into the match. The live crowd just booed the entire time. They tried to start a wave. They tried to chant, we want Cena, a chant I never thought I'd hear in a WWE arena. Uh, This was during the absence of him when he wasn't on TV for a couple months, off to go film his American Grit show or whatever. So anyway, Sheamus retained. Uh, They had a lot of cool spots, and the crowd popped for a lot of the spots they did. The 
the, the Celtic curse or the white noise through the ladder uh, or through the fucking uh, table at ringside. Uh, Roman Reigns speared him through a table. They, like, they, they did a lot of cool spots. It was a cool spot fest, but in terms of a consistently flowing match, because I remember at the time either a lot of people liked the match or they didn't like the match. I fell in the ladder in that. I didn't really like the match at all. Uh, Sheamus retained, though, because it was probably because no one gave a shit about Sheamus as champion, and people liked Roman Reigns even less, or maybe vice versa. But the bottom line was that no one cared about either one of these guys. So regardless, Sheamus retains. A lot of people started to leave. And uh, thank God we stayed, because then afterwards, Roman Reigns just goes berserk, uh, wipes out the entire League of Nations with a bunch of chair shots, just annihilates every single member. And then Triple H comes out. He destroys him, too, spears him a couple times. There's a power bomb through the table. I think on top of the table, it didn't break, and then he did it again with an elbow or something. That was definitely, uh, that was definitely, he definitely pulled an audible there. And then he speared him again. He came around through ringside, ran back, speared him at ringside, so... A good way of going off the show for a match that, not that it didn't deliver, but a match that fucking nobody cared about at all. So it's set forth, obviously, planted the seeds for Roman and Triple H going forward to WrestleMania 32. So this was the, man, I think Roman and Triple H would end, like, the next four pay-per-views. They closed that Survivor Series. They closed out this show. They closed out the Rumble. They closed out Fastlane when Triple H came out to tease the main event of WrestleMania. And they obviously closed out WrestleMania 32, so that's... Five pay-per-views right there. You can obviously tell how high they were on that match main event in WrestleMania. But anyway, TLC 2015 overall, an enjoyable show. Not as great of a show as I thought it was when I, when I was first there to see it. Um, but still, overall, a solid show. The main event was not that great, but Ambrose and Owens was well-wrestled. The opener was just above and beyond one of the best matches I've seen all year, let alone in my time as a fan, especially in person. On um, the ladder, or the uh, fucking tables match was good. Chair's match was better than expected. Rusev and Ryback was total throwaway. So was Charlotte and Paige, surprisingly. And the main event just was what it was. So overall, I think the, the positives outweighed the negatives. It was a good show. Not must-see by any means, but what is must-see is that fucking opener, the ladder match between New Day, Usos, and the Lucha Dragons. Just incredible stuff that really revolutionized tag team wrestling. So that is TLC 2015, folks. As always, be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. I, I, I appreciate the support. And that being said, this will be the final WrestleRant video of the year of 2016 before January kicks off with all new reviews of the In Your House pay-per-views also as seen on the WWE Network, so stay tuned for those. But in the meantime, in between time, you guys can find me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRant on Facebook too at facebook.com backslash graham.jason.matthews and also right here, I already said it before, like, comment, share, and subscribe. So that being said, folks, as always, be well and have a great week. I'm Graham Jason Matthews and I'll catch you guys down the road.